Okay, this is our last journal club session of the year. Thanks to everybody for attending. Uh, special thanks, obviously, to Dr. Ali Kendall, who will be leading today's discussion on incontinence in male dogs, which I'm very hopeful she will tell me how to fix these male dogs that I never seem to be able to. So I'm very <laughs> eagerly looking forward to hearing the solution to this. Um, so, uh, Ali, feel free to take it away, and um, I'll try to keep track of the track, uh, chat and stuff like that. But as always, we encourage everyone to speak up and participate and make this kind of more of a discussion than a presentation. Yeah. And um, yeah, take it away, Ali. Great, thanks. Um, thanks, JD. Yeah, I'm Ali Kendall. I think I've met quite a few people on this list already. I'm a new um, clinical professor at NC State. Um, I told JD too, I actually am doing this also in a little bit of a selfish way because I male incontinence certainly has become both a big clinical interest and research interest to me um, over the past two years since I've been at NC State. And, um, you know, what kind of perfect way to have some of the most brilliant minds all together in a single um, forum that can also share their views on male incontinence and how you manage these dogs. Because like JD just alluded to too, we don't really have a great kind of way to manage or even sometimes diagnose these dogs. So um, I know I, I sent out the paper from 2019. It's a pretty um, short, easy read paper from JSAP, but just I wanted to start with a quick review on what we know about incontinence, obviously what we know about females um, versus what we know about male dogs so far. Um, and I think one of the hardest things for me when I first started out was trying to apply the knowledge of what I knew in female dogs and applying that to male dogs. And since I've been doing more research on this topic, I've realized that, you know, we really can't do that. There's there's quite some differences both in the anatomy and their physiology of their lower urinary tract. Um, we'll talk a little bit about just kind of the brief literature that we do have on this subject. Um, and then we'll talk about the JSAP article from 2019, um, as that's the most recent one that we have. That's why I went ahead and chose that article is because it's the most recent and it was a good way to review some of the literature that we do have. And I do want to share with you guys a little bit about um, some of our preliminary findings um, that we found in male dogs um, so far over the last two years. Um, so as a quick review, I don't need to review this too much with this group, um, but Obviously, when we're talking about incontinence, we look mostly at the external urethral sphincter, the urethralis muscle. And in female dogs, um, what we can see on the top left is that it tends to be kind of a more focal area um, versus in male dogs, this muscle or the striated muscle really encompasses almost the last two thirds of um, the urethra in males. And so it doesn't seem to be in dogs kind of a focal area, although it's interesting in human males, and I spared you guys all the photos of the human um, male lower urinary tract, is that there is more of a focal external urethral sphincter area. And so I found myself kind of, you know, down quite a few wormholes with this um, and, and trying to research this more is that you know, is there more of a focal area in male dogs that we just haven't identified yet? Or is it truly this diffuse, you know, stride and muscle throughout the entire distal urethra? Um, so if anyone has found that information, I'd be really, you know, happy to hear what you've, you've been able to find. But I've, you know, spoken with um, both our anatomists and uh, pathologists at NC State and, you know, even then we ask, you know, exactly where is the external urethral sphincter in a male dog and everyone kind of shrugs their shoulder. And so it doesn't seem like we have too much information about where exactly that's located or if it is just kind of this diffuse striated muscle. Um, looking at physiology and pathophys um, in female dogs, 
Um, obviously, we, we have a lot of research on the female dog side. Um, that USMI is certainly one of the most common, and this is talking about adult dogs. Um, and one of the big differences and one of the things that we use the most clinically is that history question of whether the incontinence occurs during recumbency or not. Um, and in female dogs, we know that that change in intra-abdominal pressure um, is associated with urinary leakage based on you know, bladder and urethral position. Um, then obviously we've got some other less common causes in females. But when we get to male dogs, all of that kind of becomes a little bit more blurry and less defined. Still don't know exactly, you know, how many male dogs um, will become incontinent. And then the most common cause, again, hasn't really been evaluated um, and what the prevalence of USMI in male dogs is. Although I'll present in the studies that's found to be, you know, maybe perhaps around 1%. So a little less than female dogs, but not actually a drastic difference. And then we know in male dogs too, we're seeing a lot more um, of detrusor urethral dyssynergia um, with both you know, urethral and detrusor abnormalities. Um, and one of the key differences with male dogs is that um, it doesn't seem to always be accompanied by that change in position or recumbency. And perhaps the intra-abdominal pressure you know, doesn't affect um, their bladder or your, their urethral location as much as it does in females. So it's kind of a hard thing to use um, because we use that history question quite commonly when evaluating females for incontinence, but that doesn't seem to translate over to males. And this was a paper um, back in 1990 that actually looked at uh, urinary incontinence causes uh, for both females and males and in juveniles it actually you know was fairly similar that even in young male dogs um, usmi and ectopic ureters were the most common along with females but then when you got over to the adult side and started looking at the adult males and more of the acquired causes you know we have a lot more that are undiagnosed um, and then seeing a lot more detrusor problems too so more detrusor instability, um, prostatic disorders. But my area, you know, that kind of interests me is what are all of these undiagnosed cases? Um, you know, were they just not able to get a definitive diagnosis or is there more going on um, that we haven't determined yet? So I probably don't need to review this too much with this group, but you know, certainly I, I find this as well with female dogs is that we have this kind of stepwise diagnostic approach that we take, although in a lot of cases, even in the female dogs, we're left with either, you know, doing cystoscopy and ruling out other anatomic um, abnormalities and making sure we've absolutely have determined that the ureters are in the appropriate position or we're left with doing a diet trial. And even then, you know, I would say that my confidence in diagnosing USMI, even in a female dog, never feels like 100%. Um, you know, you, you do all these things, you make sure you rule out other causes, but you're still left with, okay, well, I think it's USMI. So I'll go ahead and do a, a diet, um, or sorry, a therapeutic trial and see how they respond. And then I would say that that confidence is even much lower in male dogs. Um, you know, we still try to do the same steps, but we're still left with, okay, do we try a therapeutic trial and see if they respond? Um, and maybe that will help us determine whether this is USMI or whether there is something else occurring. But I think where that becomes tricky is that Females tend to have a fairly good response um, to either proin and or incurin, and so that helps with your definitive diagnosis that, okay, well, they responded quite well to that therapy, so now I feel a bit more confident in my diagnosis of USMI uh, versus male dogs really have a, a fairly minimal to poor response, um, and so 
again, you're left with that question, was this USMI and they're just a poor responder or is there something else going on? Um, and so this was the study done um, actually at NC State back in 2017. Um, by J.S. Palerm, where they looked at um, response to testosterone and, again, found anywhere from about 38 to 45 percent of those dogs. So not even half of those dogs actually responded well um, to testosterone supplementation. This was one um, actually looking back at um, 37 male dogs with USMI. So same kind of thing, but they looked at more of um, proin and um, estrogens and similar findings. Most, the majority of these dogs um, actually had a pretty poor response to therapy. Um, so looking at proin, um, which is, tends to be one of our first lines of therapy for any incontinence, you know, only five dogs had an excellent response, two had a good response, um, but nine dogs, so over half of these dogs actually had a, a fairly poor response. Um, so what else do we know about incontinence in male dogs? And again, it's not much, um, you know, looking back through the literature, you'll find lots of stuff on female dogs, um, but the literature is fairly sparse for male dogs. Um, so probably the largest study that we have so far is this retrospective that looked at USMI in male dogs. Um, they, this study was actually done on 121 dogs um, that were incontinent and they determined that 54 had USMI. So I still wonder what happened with those other 67 dogs. Um, you know, were they diagnosed with something else. Um, the other thing that I found interesting in this study is that they had a, a fairly large proportion of dogs that ended up being euthanized to their disease. Um, and so again, it begs the question of, are we just diagnosing them later in more advanced stages of their disease? Um, or is there still you know, more going on that we don't know um, due to their lack of response to therapy? Um, we also have another study on USMI that looked at, um, you know, bladder neck position, urethral length, and the effect of castration, and, you know, kind of same thing, found that, um, you know, highlighted, really highlighted the differences between the males and the females. Um, we've got a few studies on ectopic ureters um, in male dogs. And then again, very sparse studies done on response to therapy. Um, you know, we've got one on testosterone, the one I showed on proin and estrogens, um, and then a few studies looking at surgery um, as a treatment. So um, one of the things I thought was really interesting and over the last two years or so, um, Shelly Vaden and I have had this conversation of you know, it seems like we're seeing a lot more male dogs present with incontinence. And is that true? Um, and if it is, you know, why? And so I'm interested from everyone else on this um, discussion is if they also feel like they're seeing more male dogs. And so I went back through the NC State um, records and found that you know, from the from 2003 going all the way back to 2003 to now is that certainly we are seeing a lot more cases. Um, and so this goes from left to right. Um, I'm not really sure what happened here in 2006, but seemed to be a spike that year. Um, and I calculated out the preva prevalence based on our overall hospitalization population for dogs, um, obviously, as we're seeing more cases, but you can see that our prevalence has also been on a pretty drastic incline um, over the last, um, you know, 10 years or so. Um, 2020, I will say, is probably an outlier as we our caseload has massively decreased this year. Um, so I imagine that if we were on a normal caseload that we probably would have seen even more. But, you know, even back last year, we saw 146 um, dogs present, male dogs present with incontinence, which is certainly a lot. 
And so that brought me to um, the most recent study in 2019 is looking at the overall prevalence. You know, this was kind of right around the time we were talking about the prevalence at our institution, if it's increasing, and then saw that this study came out. So I, you know, thought to myself, okay, well, what what is the rest of the world seeing? Are we just seeing a lot more because we're a tertiary referral hospital and we're seeing the cases that are more, you know, dramatically affected? And so this study by Hall um, was published in 2019 or just last year, looking at the prevalence um, of urinary incontinence in male dogs in England. So they want to estimate kind of the overall uh, prevalence in male dogs um, and to also evaluate any demographic risk factors. Their hypothesis um, was that certain breeds would have an increased odds ratio. Those breeds were the Irish Setter, the Doberman, uh, the Bull Mastiff, the Rough Collie, the Dalmatian, and the Boxer. And that was done based on what they've seen in female dogs um, in that area of the country. They also thought that increased age would have an increased odds ratio. Uh, they affected um, neutering and sex status. And that increased body weight um, would also increase their odds of developing incontinence. Um, so how they did this, they have a um, vent compass animal surveillance system, which is um, an electronic patient record uh, that primary care uh, facilities in England um, can contribute to. In this study, they had about 119 uh, primary care facilities that um, submitted their records to this electronic system. They evaluated all male dogs that had at least one um, electronic record of having incontinence. And their time frame was 2009 to 2013, so they just looked over a four-year period. Um, one of the things that they did not do in this study, which we'll talk about as a limitation too, is that um, they looked at the overall prevalence um, over that four-year time span. So again, I'd be interested to see what each prevalence per year was and if they're also seeing um, a rise per year like we seem to be here in the US. Um, so this was a cohort study um, with cross-sectional analysis to look at prevalence um, and risk factors. Um, their inclusion criteria was just um, some form of diagnosis of urinary incontinence in the electronic patient record or um, a prescription of a specific um, urinary incontinence therapy. Um, the only three therapies that they had listed um, was proin and estrogen supplementations. Um, I didn't see anything about um, testosterone, but again, this was back you know, prior to 2013. And their only exclusion criteria was uh, any urinary incontinence uh, secondary to a seizure. So they really want to capture all of um, the dogs that were presenting. They then defined each case as either pre-existing or incident. So pre-existing meaning that they uh, already had this diagnosis prior to presenting to the primary veterinarian or that it was diagnosed at the time um, that the electronic patient record was evaluated. They also recorded death um, and whether or not uh, urinary incontinence uh, was a contributing factor to that. So these are the things that they looked at. Um, they looked at breed, um, whether they're purebred versus um, crossbred or mixed breed dogs. They also looked at um, their kennel club's breed groups um, and broke it down into group. Um, they looked at neuter um, status, uh, whether they had insurance or not, the age at the time of diagnosis. So they tried to go back and look at um, what age they were um, at that first uh, incident case. Their body weight, um, again, at the time that they were uh, diagnosed. Um, if they were juveniles, they took their um, adult stable body weight. And then they broke that down into breed uh, relative body weight too. 
Um, so they, this was mostly a descriptive study. They did use Stata version 13. Um, and for prevalence, again, they looked at the overall prevalence over that four-year time frame. And then they looked at each breed-specific prevalence as well, too. So mostly descriptive uh, for breed, neuter, insurance, age, and body weight. And then they looked used binary logistic uh, regression modeling to look at risk factors. Um, so this is the breakdown of the dogs. Um, they had about 110,000 male dogs um, total, so that's what they used to calculate their prevalence. Out of that, they had about 2,300 um, that had urinary incontinence listed somewhere in their electronic patient record. They went through and manually checked about 860 of those records to make sure that they qualified and found about 383 of those uh, met the inclusion criteria. Um, so 345 were incident cases, meaning they um, were diagnosed at the time of the medical record. And so those cases they used um, for both of their descriptive demographics, but also for their risk factor analysis. Um, and then the 38 pre-existing cases um, were just used for demographics. So they had um, mostly purebred dogs. Um, so about 83% of the dogs were purebred um, and 80, about 85% were neutered. And then about half of their dogs um, were insured. They found uh, median body weight was about um, 18 kilograms, so kind of medium um, dogs. And uh, age was a little bit higher, 11.6 years, which is certainly a little bit higher than what we've found in similar studies in female dogs. So again, beg the question of, are these dogs just getting uh, diagnosed later um, and coming in um, much later in life? Or are they truly developing incontinence much later in life and certainly have more acquired causes um, than in female dogs? So these were the breeds that were um, most highly diagnosed. Um, so the Labrador Retriever, um, the West Highland White Terrier, the Jack Russell Terrier, um, the Staffordshire Bull Terrier, and the English uh, Springer Spaniel. Um, but this, I think, is obvious that these are also popular breeds in the UK, um, so didn't show any increase in prevalence. Um, but out of those 110,000 dogs, these were the most common um, diagnosed. Um, but then when they looked at prevalence, um, that kind of shifted. So dogs with the highest prevalence compared to their overall population um, was the Irish Setter, the Fox Terrier, um, the Bull Mastiff, the Boxer, and the English Springer Spaniel. Um, they looked at, you know, the how many were prescribed um, treatments. So only about 18% were actually prescribed any therapy for their incontinence. And then about half of the dogs that they looked at in the study ended up um, dying. Um, median age, about 13 years. Most of those dogs were euthanized. So 97% were euthanized and about 40% of those listed the incontinence as being contributory. Um, when they looked at overall risk factor, um, kind of similar breeds showed up for risk factor. Um, the highest risk factors were the Bull Mastiff and the Irish Setter, and then the Fox Terrier, Boxer, and Bulldog. So other things that um, played a role in the odds ratio, one is that the neuter status um, did not affect the odds ratio. And I wanted to specifically throw that in because that's something that, um, you know, we, we have done a lot of research um, on in females. 
And previous studies back in the 90s um, suspected that it would. And the thought process being that actually a larger prostate is more supportive of the urethra. And so perhaps neutering them and um, having a smaller prostate, you have less support on the urethra and it, it might change um, the bladder position and cause a more caudally displaced bladder. But they found that that was not the case and they didn't see an increased odds ratio. They also did not see an increased odds ratio with body weight um, like we do in female dogs. Again, thought to be mostly due to bladder position and that changes in body weight um, don't necessarily affect bladder and urethral um, positioning in male dogs. They did find that um, older dogs had a, had a much higher odds ratio. Um, again, it is kind of begs the question of, are they just getting diagnosed um, later in life? There's thought that male dogs, you know, have this more sex protective mechanism that because they have, you know, much longer urethra and a much longer external urethral sphincter that perhaps it takes more drastic, severe disease before we start seeing clinical signs. Um, dogs that were insured had a higher odds ratio, which makes sense that they're probably presenting to the veterinarian um, probably more frequently or maybe earlier than dogs that do not have insurance. And then looking at the um, breeds, um, being a purebred, working breed dogs, hounds, um, pastoral, which I didn't know what pastoral was, but that's for us in America, the herding breeds. And then the terrier breeds all had an increased odds ratio. So again, they looked at overall prevalence um, over that four year time um, span and found that the overall prevalence was up about 1%, um, so 0.94%. But again, I, you know, kind of was interesting, I'd wanna know, you know, again, what, what each year looks like and if they're also seeing a rise in cases as well. So um, limitations, obviously um, so they had a small sample size of some of these breeds, um, so that can affect the calculations for the odd ratio. It is a retrospective study, um, so not you know, all uh, underlying conditions um, were excluded. And then again, how many of these dogs was incontinence a definitive diagnosis? Um, they may have seen some bias from the participating primary care practices in the area. And then obviously the uh, big limitation, and this is just a limitation of male incontinence, is that there's a low treatment rate, um, but a high euthanasia rate. So, Again, is it more severe um, or are we just less likely to treat these dogs? Um, so I still had some continued questions, you know, reading through this study uh, recently too is, again, is the prevalence increasing um, or are we just recognizing it more? Um, and then again, what are the common underlying etiologies? So we know that it might be increasing in prevalence, um, you know, but our last studies looking back on etiologies of male dogs kind of go all the way back into the 90s. And so is there more um, that we should know now? And what are the best management strategies? Knowing what we know about how they respond to medical therapy is, is there something else that we should be doing? Or do we really have the correct diagnosis in a lot of these? So going back, you know, I've spent some time looking at the, our prevalence of, you know, why are we seeing more cases? Um, again, are we just having them referred earlier? Um, and primary veterinarians are, you know, realizing the difficulty in managing these cases and referring them over earlier? Or are we truly seeing a rise in male dogs in the United States developing incontinence at some point? Um, and so I like all of these. Shelly has shared um, these studies that she's looked at too. Is um, 
you know, one of the things we've also noticed, and I'll be interested if other people has, have too, is not only are we seeing more male incontinence, we're also seeing a lot more detrusor urethral dyssynergia in male dogs as well. And so, you know, are we just seeing more overflow incontinence in bladder acne? And how much of that is affected by husbandry recently? Um, so, you know, perhaps back in the 90s um, or some, when some of these other re more recent studies were done, um, you know, maybe there wasn't as much overflow incontinence, but are we seeing that now, given that more and more male dogs are at home for much longer periods of time? So we know that in America, particularly, our workday seems to be getting longer and more and more people in the household are working to contribute. And so I think a lot of dogs have been left at home um, or kenneled for longer periods of time. And so how much of this, you know, is, is also playing into the male dogs with nutrition disorders that we're seeing. And so one of the things we were really interested in Again, trying to just see is bladder acne and detrusor acne on the rise in male dogs is looking at the urine residual volume in just about every male dog that walked into our clinic um, with a micturition disorder. And so we know that urine residual volume is a pretty good way to assess bladder function. Um, normal residual volume is anywhere between 0.2 to 0.4 mils per kg. Um, some of the other studies have gone upwards to maybe one mil per kg um, being normal. Um, but we know that more than one mil per kg, or at least a persistent increase, um, can lead to pretty serious consequences and detrusor acne. Um, this is something I've looked at a lot in the human side. Um, and actually, that bladder acne can start to occur pretty quickly. Um, and you know, may not resolve as quickly as, as we thought that it would. Um, the most direct way to measure urine residual volume is placing a urinary catheter after they've gone outside and seeing how much is left, although pretty high risk of infection, um, you know, to be doing that just for client-owned dogs walking in the clinic um, for evaluation. You know, we would hate to be introducing the risk of a UTI um, just by catheterizing them to see what their urine residual volume is. Um, 2D does a fairly good job. Um, there's some formulas uh, for 2D, although the hard part is, is that um, there's a lot of published 2D ultrasound formulas for evaluating um, bladder volume, and there's not any gold standard of which one is the best. Um, but certainly in academia, 2D is, is very limited. You know, that's something that we have to schedule with radiology, um, take the dog down to radiology, um, put them on their black back, um, oftentimes almost always having to sedate them because it's a teaching hospital. Um, and so they their ultrasounds last um, much longer, probably certainly much longer than in private practice. Um, and so... We actually, about two years ago, um, purchased a 3D ultrasound machine, which is what they use in people um, as standard of care for measuring bladder volume, um, and decide, okay, could this work for our dogs um, as a quick and easy way to determine bladder volume? And so it's pretty cool. You put it on their bladder. Um, they can be in any position, so standing, um, lying lateral, or lying on their back um, and you just push a button and in real time on the screen it outlines the bladder like you can see and gives you a volume estimate right then and there. Um, so that's been really nice to use for patients who are just coming in for a consultation because um, it's pretty quick and gives us a good estimate. Um, so this is what we found so far and I apologize I have um, probably double um, this amount um, of dogs at, at this point, but I haven't been able, didn't have a chance before this presentation to rerun my stats. Um, but what we found so far is it's about 50-50. Um, so about 50% of the dogs that um, presented with urinary incontinence 
um, about 50% had really significantly elevated um, urine residual volumes. And then about 50% of them had pretty normal urine residual volumes. Um, and so what we've been able to use this for is that, you know, those dogs who have a fairly significantly increased urine residual volume is lean maybe more towards overflow incontinence and managing their detrusor muscle versus if they had a, a very low or normal urine residual volume is feeling maybe a little bit more confident in managing them like a USMI and seeing how they responded to therapy. So I know that was pretty quick um, just because um, that study was is pretty short. And again, there's not a lot in the veterinary literature about males, but I really wanted to turn this into now more of a discussion and hear other people's experiences um, with male incontinence. Um, you know, are you seeing more cases? Do you feel like your prevalence is also on the rise? Um, do you feel confident in your diagnosis or do you still feel like you're treating them for suspected USMI and just crossing your fingers and seeing if they respond to therapy? Um, or is there some other management um, that you're doing? Particularly, I want to see, you know, if other people are using urine residual volume um, in their initial um, consultation and, and if it, you feel it's helping you with getting to a definitive diagnosis or not. Yeah, thanks so much, Ellie. That's great. Um, I'll uh, I'll let people chime in and also chat as well too, and I'll give some of my uh, experience. I find that I I try to look at uh, urinary residual volume as a uh, as a metric as part of my assessment, um, but I I I guess I still have um, tried um, trials of medications even if they're vol they didn't seem like they were having um, retention, you know, it, I think it's a good metric to have, but I just haven't always seen that they've uh, acted predictably as I would have expected with giving trials of, of proin, of oxybutynin, of um, bethanicol, of you know, eye of newt, you know, anything else that I can think of to give some of these dogs. Um, and so I often am just going through different trials of medications and I've, I've done testosterone and lots of things, but usually find that um, the majority of them are still pretty leaky despite the trial of a lot of those medications. So I, I do try to capture that volume. Uh, it, I don't think it's led me personally to be able to find the solution to these guys. I still find that they tend to leak despite a lot of the medications that I end up trying. Allie? Yeah. Yes. Uh, this is Julie Byron um, from OSU. Um, so I actually, I would say the vast majority of the cases that I see for male incontinence are going to be functional obstruction cases with overflow incontinence. I still see maybe a third of them are, I, I mean, I'd have to go back and look at the numbers to be most accurate, but my impression is that only about a third of them are dogs who I would say is are likely to be USMI and the um, the majority are DUD cases. And I feel like the, I actually tend to start with something like Prazosin or Tamsulosin um, and potentially Valium as well. One of the things that I've actually noticed is we have dogs that get functional obstruction when they are very anxious and stressed. We see a ton of greyhounds because we have a specifically funded greyhound program at Ohio State. And so we take a lot of greyhounds right off the track. Half of those dog, male dogs cannot pee when they come off the track. They're really anxious. They're really nervous. And so we give them prazosin and everything and sometimes, you know, trazodone or whatever other drugs. And then when we get them into a situation when they where they're in a permanent home and they're more comfortable, oftentimes it self-resolves. We even have large breed dogs that are in the hospital after an orthopedic surgery. They're anxious, they're in the hospital, they're in pain, and they mm -hmm. suddenly won't pee or they can't pee. They'll go out and they'll act, you know, they'll just dribble a little bit even when they're actively trying. So I personally feel like there may be an anxiety component to this. And in children, there is some evidence, you probably came across it in your reading that there's some evidence that in children, 
who have problems with functional obstruction, there may be an emotional component as well. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, that's something, um, you know, certainly that, that we've looked at too. And that's something as, as well that I've, you know, as I've been documenting all of these dogs that come in um, to our institution is also looking at their anxiety levels. And so, yeah, it is, it's, it's hard because I agree with, with both of you guys that there is, there's so many um, variables that come into play. So it, you know, it just seems like, again, it's not as straightforward as, you know, the female dog presenting with USMI. Um, yeah. Do you guys, uh, Julie, are you guys doing urethral pressure profiling still? Do you guys have um, any data on some of these male dogs specifically on, on what we might be seeing or is anybody else doing UPPs on these dogs? So I did one um, just about uh, a month ago. I finally got my machine, my air air charged machine up and running, which by the way, if anybody's thinking about updating their uh, Eurodynamic system, get the air charged one. It is so much better than the water ones. It's way easier. The nice thing about a male dog is we don't have to sedate them or anesthetize them or anything because at least in many of my cases, I teach the owners how to catheterize their dogs. Um, so the dogs actually get really comfortable with catheterization. But if you can catheterize the dog, it works really nicely because the dog's awake for both the CMG and the UPP. The interesting thing is, um, again, uh, Dr. Kennel, I'm sure you came across this too in your reading, is that in people and in rat studies, these dogs develop, or these patients with a functional obstruction develop overactive bladder. And um, I actually didn't, have not seen that in the cases I've, I've looked at. Um, but anyway, that's an aside thing. I've only done a couple cases. I need to, um, I've actually, I'm glad you're at NC State because Shelly and I, a couple of years ago, before, probably before you started, started talking about doing, starting to do your dynamics on these incontinent male dogs. And I would love, and I've talked to Jody Westrop about this too, I would love it if we could develop a really nice protocol for doing male dogs and get a multi-institutional study. That way we can get enough cases to really get a good picture of how many of these dogs in the U.S. are, are uh, have functional obstruction, how many have overactive bladder, where the obstructions are happening, all of those things. I think it would be a fantastic multi-institutional study to do for those people who have the um, urodynamic system. Yeah, I agree. And I, I, I mean, I think looking at these dogs, you know, now, you know, especially seeing if, if everyone else's prevalence is increasing, you know, we have enough of these dogs now at, at multiple institutions um, and private practices to just evaluate these dogs in general about, you know, where, how are we managing them, um, you know, what diagnostics were done, um, and what their definitive diagnosis ended up being. I think that would be really, really interesting. Yeah, because I find the frustrating point of I, I see these dogs and their bladder is not overextended, and it doesn't seem like obviously they're having overflow incontinence. Their stream is normal, they have no problem um, voiding, but the dogs are having mostly uh, nocturnal incontinence, and uh, it just it just doesn't all seem to to line up. And they just tend not to always respond, and um, and you know usually we'll end up scoping them and make sure that we don't have anything, any anatomic abnormalities. But clearly, you know, without having a, a UPP system, you know, I'm just then having to rely on how big is their bladder, pre urination, post urination, and what's their anatomy look like to try to localize what. The disease process might be and then ultimately put um, top it off with just trials of medications to see if they might respond to x y or z but they tend not to be as responsive um, or we end up trying three or four different drugs before maybe we find something that helps but they're they're always a pain in the butt and i wish that there was a an easier way to to go about getting to the bottom of it um, without you know right you know, right from the beginning, having a, a, the best inclination of, oh, they need this medication or that, it hasn't seemed to correlate well to me when I look at their urine volume. But 
I've also had dogs that just have failed everything too, so maybe they're just not gonna fit into any hole. So is anybody putting sphincters, a, um, artificial sphincters on these? Because for a while we were putting artificial sphincters on these male dogs that failed everything. And almost to a T, they all were disasters. Well, and I was just going to ask on a similar note, um, if anybody's con doing contrast studies on these, because we, you know, I've gone back and forth over the years as to whether I rely just on cystoscopy or whether I'm going to do a contrast study to try to assess if there's any dilation throughout the urethra. And we've done a couple males that they just seem to have, you know, more diffusely dilated urethras and then they wouldn't you wouldn't expect that they would be able to respond to medication and i'm not sure that i can necessarily detect that with accuracy with cystoscopy although i'll also say that i'm not aware that there is really good anatomic standardization of a male urethrogram radiographically either i've done a couple of stud contrast studies on these and so one of the interesting things is that and i usually do the contrast study before i scope them one of the really interesting things is a couple of the dogs I found have absolutely enormously dilated prostatic urethras. And what it makes me think of is when you have a GI obstruction that where's the obstruction? Is it possible that the obstruction is more in the skeletal muscle and not the smooth muscle? And that's one of the things that why I oftentimes will add a benzo on. Um, and I've even had one patient that I put on baclofen because the benzo, I couldn't get a good balance between quality of life and relaxation. And so, um, but then I've had other cases where the prostatic urethra was at least what the radiologist called normal dilation. Uh, I what was referring to the urethral sphincter mechanism in confidence dogs, sorry, because just trying to see why they are not responding to their medication. Because you would think that if you can separate them out by big bladder, little bladder, that they would respond to either testosterone or USMI. And I agree that some of them do, but it's still not. And I think, I think that if you can pull out the dogs that have um, a large uh, residual volume and then aim your medication in different arms, so the ones that have a small residual volume, you treat them as urethral sphincter mechanism incompetence. My guess is that the response rate is a little bit higher than what's previously been reported, but I still don't think it's, it's nearly, you know, the 80 to, 90 percent that we can get with females yeah, I, I would agree with you shelly i i have the same experiences uh i tend to do more contrast studies in male dogs and i have seen a variety of shapes of urethras from overriding to really dilated as you say in the prostatic area to uh looking normal and but if they've got a large residual volume i'm usually thinking i've got uh, increased skeletal tone going on. And what is, I want to know too, everyone's first line of therapy that they're using with USMI. Are, you know, is everyone going towards proin? Or are you reaching for testosterone first? Um, you know, the consensus of what people are, are using. Proin first and have not been super impressed by it. And then I think I have two recent dogs where we've done testosterone, and I think one had um, maybe mild to moderate improvement, and the other one had none. Um, I think consistent with uh, with your most recent paper that was out there, but um, that that's usually the order I go in if I think it's USMI. Yeah, so 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 do I. I usually start with proin first, and <clears throat> then some testosterone. And I've often done the combination of PPA and testosterone because I, I agree with Julia that testosterone itself and seems to be a hit or miss proposition. Is anybody has anybody else tried the the uh, artificial urethral sphincter in these males? And what was your experience with it? I have, and I have not been happy. Hi, I, I'm not sure if you can hear me or not, but yeah, we've we've done. This is Martin Foreman. I'm at Cornell in in Stanford, Connecticut. We've done two cases now where we've done it, and um, I don't know if we have enough follow up on it. It's only been, I would say, a couple of months, but so far they have worked. 
Um, these two cases, though, were, were very complicated anatomically, um, and I, I don't know if they're representative of um, the older, these were younger dogs that had been chronically incontinent since they were very young. Well, I think this has been great. Thank you, everyone. I, I This has been a really good discussion. Um, I think it kind of reinforces that there's still a lot you know, we don't really know um, about these male dogs and, and how to approach them. So, you know, I'd be happy to, you know, come up with some multi-institutional studies to start looking at them more and, and trying to determine a, a good treatment protocol. But I think still that, you know, my big question is, you know, again, what is their definitive diagnosis and what steps should we be doing to get to a definitive diagnosis so that we know how to treat them? I was curious too if people are also seeing a rise in the truth or urethral dyssynergia um, and you know what management strategies they're choosing for those dogs. I feel like personally I haven't had amazing success no matter what treatment protocol I choose, um, you know, controlling their mictrician disorder. I'd say that I've seen more dyssynergia cases, but I, I have seen more male incontinent cases, which is a little interesting. Um, yeah, I, I that's been my experience. I don't know if others are different, but it, they seem to be leaking more rather than not being able to leak, at least in DC. Yeah, I think that's our, our experiences as well, too. I, um, we're actually pulling data as well to look at um, dysenergia cases um, at NCSU. Um, and I haven't looked at the, the prevalence um, directly compared to the prevalence of, of incontinence, but certainly seems like we're seeing a lot more um, incontinent dogs. Um, I had to step out a little bit earlier, so I might have missed it, but I was wondering if people had seen much positive response to trials with oxybutynin in, in any of their male dogs. I've had it fail more often than help, but I will similarly do that as a trial since I don't have UPT to get a more definitive answer. I'll, I tend to just go through a roulette of the various medications to see if they respond, then hopefully that tells them what their pathophysiology is. But I haven't been that um, lucky to have beneficial effects with it. We have, I, I personally have not used it. Um, I don't know, Shelly, have you used it? I don't know if we've ever discussed that. I've tried it in females. I don't ever remember trying it in a male. And females, I have such bad success, <clears throat> low success rate with it that I haven't even thought to try it in a male. You certainly could. I tried in a few males after <clears throat> I came across the literature saying that chronic fun functional obstruction, and actually in rats, it's as soon as like 12 days after the obstruction occurs. Um, and in humans, they think that it might be that quick as well that in rats and, and humans, you know, men mainly, it occurs, they get overactive bladder. That's part of the pro problem with why they get incontinence on top of the functional obstruction and the um, urine retention. And so I tried it, but I, it hasn't helped as often as I thought it would. So that would be another reason to do your dynamic studies on these, on the functional obstruction dogs, as well as just the regular incontinent males, because we can do them awake and I think we, it would be really interesting to find out because I'm not so sure that they have an overactive component, at least in the chronically obstructed ones that overflow. The US, more USMI ones or, you know, whatever we're going to call the just incontinent ones who don't have obstruction. Um, I don't know. I mean, it, it would be an easy enough thing to do if we can just get um, some your dynamic protocols together for it. 
And Julie, I was going to do, do you feel like you have good success rate with your Eurodynamic studies? I, I, I actually, I did my residency at Purdue with Larry and I felt like occasionally, you know, we, we did a lot of Eurodynamic studies was that some of them went really well and we felt pretty confident with the results, but also there were the ones, you know, that, that didn't go well and so we were still kind of left square one. So I want to know what other people's experiences have been using neurodynamic studies if you feel like it, it's truly been beneficial in getting to a diagnosis um i feel like i like the new systems better um i have not done much of the emg stuff because nobody's really determined exactly where you put the emg needles in a male or a female dog but um i did my master's degree using neurodynamics you know 20 years ago 15 years ago and that's why i hate the, the water charge systems but um, it, in males, I think we have a much better chance of finding out what's going on because we don't have to sedate them. Or at least if we sedate them, we can immediately reverse them and, and do the entire procedure awake. Because in females, you know, just because you just hit the catheter in them, you gotta knock them out. And males, it's so easy to just get the catheter in them. And, you know, this dog we did a month ago just basically sat there on the floor while we were, you know, we wanted him to stand. Unfortunately, he wouldn't stand for most of it. But um, I think we're going to get fewer artifacts. Um, I think the the more difficult thing is going to be protocol and technique. Um, things like for a CMG, how fast you fill the bladder. And this was something that Westrop and I were going over and kind of trying to figure out because she's done it in cats. You know, and do you want to really do a two hour CMG because if you want to have truly physiologic bladder filling, you know, do you give them Lasix? Do you, I don't know, there's there's a lot of controversies about that or are you going to artificially induce things or suppress bladder um, spasming by filling too fast? Do you use uh, body temperature fluids or do you use room temperature colder fluids? Um, you know, there's a lot of little things, and that's one of the things that'd be nice to work out some protocols so that everybody's doing things exactly the same way. I think females, um, as somebody who has written a lot about urodynamics, I think in female dogs, there's less usefulness and utility um, outside of research. And I think in males, it's going to have more of a diagnostic role. I was just going to comment before we leave that probably what we need to do as a society is really make good definitions for this disease. Because I think that's what's wrong with this paper is that they use a human definition which really doesn't respond with how we treat our patients. And you guys have already indicated that, that we need to think about how we classify it better. Um, so whether or not we classify it with normal voiding phase of urination um, so that we eliminate those that are functionally or structurally obstructed. And so when I look at the literature, it's just so messed up that I don't think we can get anything out of it in terms of treatment or even any demographics like this paper did. Yeah, that's an excellent point. So maybe that should be a goal of the society, just like they're doing with the um, um, with either UTI or proteinuria, so that we have some subcategories that we can actually monitor disease and decide what therapy would work. And is it okay, Jody, if I just sign you up to be the chair of that project? <laughs> Maybe. I'm going to retire one day. I'm older than you are, <laughs> but that's fine. <laughs> well, after this, then then you can get the green light to retire. So you have plenty of time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no, that, that really is, needs to be done. <laughs> yeah, I think that that is something that, uh, you know, these rounds are so good because it's great to speak to everybody and then also realize that we're, we're also similar in the same boat with these same struggles as I think Shelly said, like we win together and go down together at the same time, which is, is so true. Um, so I, I think if we can, if we can try to create some definitions um, that'll allow us to standardize things going forward and then certainly applying some of these protocols and even making, you know, 
you know, after this, like, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit more interested in maybe getting a Eurodynamic system to try to figure out some of these nail dogs than I was an hour ago, you know, thinking I probably am not going to benefit from that. So, you know, we could maybe generate interest and get some better definitions and some more uh, concrete diagnoses for these patients. So uh, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get some people signed up for it. It sounds like a great idea. Yeah, well, this has been this has been really great. Thank you, everyone. I, you know, Shelly can vouch for me too that I sometimes spend hours going down this tangent of trying to figure out incontinence in male dogs. So it's it's nice to know that I'm not alone, <laughs> and everyone else has some a lot of questions and and difficulties too. But I hope that yes, the, my goal is that this would spark a discussion. Um, you know, and maybe we can put our, our minds all together and, and try to better characterize these dogs. Well, thanks so much, Allie, for leading the presentation. That was really great. I really appreciate uh, all the hard work and time that you put into it. It was terrific. Um, and yes, this is our last one of the year. So I wish everybody happy holidays and happy new year. And uh, stay tuned for emails from me about the, the upcoming presentations. Uh, hopefully, I have put in enough desperate pleas that have encouraged people to sign up to present in the new year. Um, and uh, you can go back through probably any of my emails to see the links for the sign up sheet. But I will be sending out the link to the next one when we have it. And hope everyone has a great holiday and look forward to uh, chatting and hopefully seeing some of you in the new year if uh, everything goes well. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Great work. <laughs>